now joining the stage from WSO2. Um, we'll be talking about decentralized reference architecture. Great to see you again, Asanka. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah. Let me share my screen first. Hope you can see my screen. Wonderful. Okay, okay great. You're ready to okay. go. This fa a fascinating talk. Um, I'll let you jump straight into it. Yep. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak at API Days again. This is my fourth event uh, for the year. Uh, so uh, I'm Asanka Basinger, Chief uh, Technology Evangelist at WSO2. Uh, so WSO2 is a technology company that we provide API management, integration, and uh, security solutions. But today I'm not going to talk about it, that we have a booth. If you're interested, you can go there and chat with our folks. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, continue from the uh, from where Eric stopped because uh, this is nicely connected, uh, what he spoke about, autonomous teams and exposing APIs because uh, the pattern that I'm planning to uh, explain here uh, nicely connect with uh, what he explained as well. So uh, what I'm planning to do during next uh, 20 to 25 minutes is uh, uh, explain why we created this new pattern and then how we created it uh, as well as uh, in detail about uh, what exists in this uh, architecture pattern. So I, I published this paper in 2018 uh, summer and after I published the architecture paper, I got invited to many architecture conferences to speak about uh, this topic. And uh, because of the topic, uh, a lot of people came inside the room. And But when I look at their faces, I saw something like this because uh, they came uh, due to the interest of the topic, but they were they had a question whether this guy is smoking because as you know, there are a lot of uh, architecture patterns available and uh, we know microservices, cloud native type of patterns are well established. So people were wondering why uh, I introduced a new pattern, but uh, uh, I was not smoking. Uh, we had uh, really good reasons to uh, uh, build this pattern. And the main motivation behind this was um, the mismatch that we identified in the industry because there are a lot of patterns available but architects are uh, looking for something slightly different different so uh, bridging that mismatch was our main motivation so there were some design principles behind that the first thing we identified existing reference architectures are uh, centralized and layered uh, but uh, you know the problem with the centralized and layered approach that layers creating a lot of gates and it's really hard to pass those gates and uh, organizations are organized uh, based on these layers as well so it's not helping the agility and uh, blocking our flow and centralized nature also not that productive that lot of control and unnecessary governance associated with that so this wasn't a, a good approach and if you look at most of the architecture diagrams architects draw, those are very clean using um, most uh, latest technologies well aligned like you see in the um, picture. But if you look at the reality in the enterprise, it looks like this because it is not that great uh, like we see because we purchase many uh, database systems, we purchase many application systems, uh, still we need those data and systems to run our enterprises. So we have to deal with all the existing legacy or monolithic systems that we have in our uh, servers. So we can't avoid that. So what we identified, uh, the existing reference architectures are either addressing one spectrum, either greenfield or brownfield, but reality is not that. We have legacy as well as new uh, greenfield applications. So we need to find a way to link these two. So when we are defining this new pattern, we have to address both was another design principle that we had. Then another thing that uh, I identified during this research work, uh, most of the reference architectures are not reference architectures per se, those are reference implementations bound to a specific technology or a specific vendor technology. But what uh, we believe that uh, reference architectures should be vendor and technology neutral. Uh, so that was another design uh, principle that we had 
uh, that way the architect can repair the architecture pattern and pick any technology that he or she would like to uh, apply then the underutilization of the technology is another thing that I experienced while working with many architects in the industry. Uh, because of the architecture flexibility wasn't great, they can't introduce new systems uh, or new technologies into the, uh, the existing uh, running uh, system architecture. Uh, as example, sometimes when I talk to architects, they say, okay, I have a Kafka uh, broker running, but I can't use it with some of my uh, systems. And sometimes they say okay i am i have a kubernetes cluster but most of my applications can't port in that particular system so there was a limitation and we wanted to address that and the last design principle was um, something very important as well we identified there's a, a mismatch between the architecture development and deployment that the architect will design something developer will develop something slightly different and then uh, the developers engineer will go and deploy something else so we wanted to identify a common construct across the architecture development and deployment uh, so uh, we thought of address that while we are doing this um, exercise so before jump into the pattern let's look at um, uh, a little bit history so this is uh, the way we uh, used a different type of architecture patterns during last Last two decades, starting from monolith, we moved to two tier with uh, the databases are, or database technologies are getting advanced. Then we moved to the three tier architecture by moving the uh, user interfaces, business logic, and data separated. And uh, that was a very interesting time when I started my career during that era. And MVC type of patterns came as sub patterns of the three tier architecture. Then uh, service oriented architecture came into the picture by wrapping the the business logic around services and APIs and many sub patterns of it came like even driven architecture, web oriented architecture, so and so forth. Then around 2012, microservices came into the picture and now we are in this more decentralized uh, uh, movement. Uh, what I want to highlight here is basically um, we move from a, a layered and centralized architecture into a more a decentralized and segmented architecture. So this is the architecture diagram that I introduced in 2011. Uh, it's not a typical layered architecture diagram. If you carefully noticed it, uh, notice that there are, it is too um, um, dimensional that I have the traditional layered architecture components built using system of systems uh, in one uh, angle and then I introduce some uh, of the key application lifecycle related uh, activities and uh, quality of services. So this was a very um, I mean, a productive diagram that we used to have many uh, discussions with architects and build many systems, even uh, the, some of the uh, users are still using this diagram. But uh, we built many systems using this, uh, but in around 2012, 2011, we hit a, a bottleneck that we identify one of the projects we were engaged uh, is failing. Uh, the project team was using agile uh, framework and um, operated in fully agile manner but unfortunately they delivered the product after three years and as you know uh, with that time of uh, time frame the requirements uh, changed and uh, the product or the project was not that valid for that particular organization then we looked at even they were following agility what went wrong and we identified the architecture is not flexible enough for them to uh, be agile. So they were not operating in true agile form. It was more kind of waterfall agile type of a approach that they had. This was eye opener for us. And uh, same time, microservices came into the picture. Uh, there are a lot of theory behind microservices, but when we looked at uh, the key uh, organizations uh, who were pioneer uh, microservices at that time, uh, they were using another layer on top of the core microservices. As an example, Netflix uh, called it as APIs, Uber called it as edge gateways, eBay uh, used the API facade pattern, and even Gartner introduced some thing called mini services into the picture. So the uh, uh, why it happened, it's basically the alignment between business and technology uh, was the 
driver uh, for the organization to add another layer on top of the uh, core microservices. Uh, to explain it in detail, if you look at the technical definition of a service, basically, uh, you make a, a specific function, a network accessible via a, a standard interface, like you just write some code and then annotate it so it will be available to access via network. But the uh, the business expectation from a service, it's basically provide a solution for a business problem. To do that, we have to connect all these technical services. Um, we did it using uh, composite services or gateways by putting uh, a layer on top of the core services. So if you look at microservices, the technical definition, again, uh, it doesn't change much. You divide that monolith services into many um, uh, multiple services uh, by based on the scope, not based on the size, uh, and uh, create many services. Even the implementation looks uh, similar. You might use a different framework, but again, write a code, annotate it, and then bind it to a port and make it available using uh, some kind of a protocol like HTTP or uh, gRPC. Again, the uh, business definition or the expectation from microservices, uh, similar to the normal services as well, the business is looking for uh, some kind of uh, uh, business capability exposed by your microservices. So once you start building 50, 100 microservices, you will start connecting these stuff using various technologies. I think Service Mesh is a good example for that, why those exist uh, to connect uh, these services and do some composition as well. So similar to normal services, you need to connect uh, these microservices by putting a gateway or uh, writing some composite services. So during that era, like 2012, 2011, late 2011, uh, the uh, organization used microservices also uh, use the layered architecture. And if you carefully notice this diagram, you will see microservices uh, has become another layer of the same uh, layered architecture because uh, those uh, services required to utilize other quality of services as well as uh, the uh, application uh, systems exist in the um, uh, data centers. And some of the uh, uh, users who was uh, uh, working with me, they had a little bit of a improved pattern that they segmented uh, the layer to different business units and had isolated units using multi-tenancy and uh, infrastructure level uh, separation as well. So this was an improved pattern and I called, uh, I started calling it as segmented architecture. And some of these users, they uh, had a different uh, pattern uh, to have the isolation they deploy the entire platform uh, locally and uh, used it as a private um, uh, instance. So I call it as platform of platforms, but again, the architecture was uh, layered. So this was a dead end that we hit after that because uh, the architecture is improving, concepts are coming, but still it is layered and centralized. So we thought of we need to look at it in a, uh, a fresh way and start it from scratch. So we did a lot of research and then our, we narrowed down our research into four areas, quantum computing and uh, several good concepts came from Kubernetes and interestingly, biology and system biology. You will understand why. Uh, during my next few slides. So why we stick to uh, biology, basically uh, the cell is the atomic unit, right? Everything um, uh, live created using a cell. So we thought that is a really good concept because uh, a cell provide a lot of capabilities and cells are interconnected. So that is why uh, we are using cell as the uh, main uh, concept and name the architecture pattern as cell-based architecture. So let's get in deep into the architecture pattern. Uh, so some concepts, um, the atomic component of the uh, architecture pattern, we call it as a component. So component can be anything that you run in your uh, infrastructure or your cloud environment. So a component can be a, a microservice, it can be a normal service, it can be a database, it can be a message broker, a gateway, a uh, uh, security uh, uh, policy engine, anything that you run in your uh, solution, uh, treat, we treat it as a component. So it's cell created by connecting multiple components. So that is the unit of uh, the enterprise architecture. Uh, so uh, it connects multiple cells. And if you look at the diagram, each and every cell contains a, a cell gateway. And inside the cell, you will get a number of 
components. Uh, so the uh, if you if you are going back to the uh, the point that I made earlier, you will have multiple services, and you have to uh, connect these services to uh, bring some business value. Same concept come here comes here. So basically, the that particular boundary of those services we call it as a cell, and then you will have the cell gateway. That is how it connect with that business and technology alignment that we discussed earlier. So cell to component ratio, basically, uh, in most cases, it is one to many. And in some cases, it can be one to one. And how these cells are connected, I'm using the standard uh, uh, way of connecting stuff these days using a control plane, a data plane, and a management plane. So that's a, a local data plane and a control plane that I call as a local mesh. Um, which connects all the components inside the uh, cell. And then there's a global mesh which connects cell to cell. So uh, the inter and intra communication happens using those two uh, data plane and control plane layers. And in addition to that, you can have a management plane as a global unit to manage uh, some of these stuff like the observability dashboards and then uh, policy management systems so and so forth. Then uh, the uh, the connections uh, basically happens in two ways, ingress and egress. So any ingress call should come through the cell gateway, but egress calls can go out to another uh, cell gateway uh, in a, another cell. So we can use Sidecar, Adapt Ambassador type of uh, microservices and cloud native friendly patterns to do the egress call. And this is the API first architecture. That's how it fit into the context of this uh, conference as well. All these connections between components and, um, and between cells happens through uh, an API. So API can vary from a traditional RESTful using HTTP and gRPC kind of protocol. So it can be uh, push APIs like events and streams. So the uh, uh, that's about the APIs. And then this API, uh, sorry, the uh, cell gateway provides some additional flexibility uh, for us because we can uh, uh, enforce policies at the gateway as well as we can enable uh, the uh, observability at the gateway automatically because any uh, call will hit some kind of a uh, cell gateway in this architecture. Then security of the cells uh, is a key important thing. So a cell can be self-contained by providing all the security related uh, uh, decisions within the control plane inside the cell, or in some cases it can go to the global control plane and get more additional information and maybe cache it to uh, the increase the performance and use it in uh, within the cell. So those uh, two patterns are supported uh, without an issue. And the developer experience is uh, similar uh, because uh, there can be multiple use cases. A developer might create a brand new cell and add components, or in many cases, they will use existing set of microservices, group them, and create a cell as well. But the developer flow, it will not change. Uh, a developer will write um, the components and then commit it, test it, uh, push it to the CI CD system. And if the test passes, it will go and deploy a component or a cell. Uh, we support uh, the architecture, um, uh, architecture supports both uh, concepts, like you can deploy a component to the cell or you can deploy the entire cell. It's totally depend on the infrastructure that you are using. So if you are using more container based, uh, the uh, flexible infrastructure, you can deploy a cell rather than you deploy a component. But if you are using a traditional hypervisor based uh, VMs, then you can deploy components as well. So each and every component contains a version, and each and every cell contains a version as well. So that creates a lot of agility or flexibility for us that I call it as a structured agility that you will have agility at the component level. Uh, and you will have agility at the cell level, and you will have agility at the enterprise level as well. Then if you look at the cell-based enterprise architecture, what you will see, bunch of cells running in your enterprise. And we can categorize these cells into logic cells, integration cells, legacy, so on and so forth. So these are the 
type of cells that we identified up to now, but we can introduce new things. But these um, cell types are well enough to address most of the uh, systems that we can identify then designing these days. Then I put a reference implementation as well. In this example, I put an employee cell, order cell, customer cell, connect with some other uh, sub cells as well. So I highlighted the one of the design principles we had uh, was to um, uh, make it completely uh, technology and uh, vendor neutral. So if you look at this, is a reference implementation, and I have used many uh, different technologies like Nginx and Spring Boot and some of the WSO2 technologies as well, and connect to many other third-party systems. So it's completely uh, com uh, the technology neutral that you can pick uh, your preferred technology and build the architecture. And this is a very human-centric architecture. We can use cell as a way to uh, define teams. Uh, a single team can own multiple cells, but uh, my advice is a uh, uh, cell cannot be owned by two teams. So it kind of create a team boundary as well and nicely fit into the agile concepts. And I wrote a detailed paper uh, in this URL. You can access it if you want more information about that. Then you can measure the success as well because you want to prove the business. Uh, you adopt to a new architecture pattern, but what's the benefit? So these type of uh, measurements like flow efficiency, a mean time to repair, a mean time to detect are good uh, parameters that you can uh, show. In the summary, uh, cell, um, self-contained you these are units of enterprise architecture you can independently uh, scale it at the component level and cell level and it has a local data plane and a control plane so as the architecture it's decentralized microservices architecture friendly cloud native compliant technology neutral human centric and you can build apis as products as well so the contribution to this uh, effort so i have published the reference architecture and a supportive document of reference methodology both documents published as a uh, creative commons so you can uh, send a pr if you like to uh, improve the uh, papers as well as if you like the content giver a get star and bunch of other technologies i have listed here that you can use to build components uh, and these are my contact details like uh, uh, you can contact me if you need to um, um, if you are building new systems and uh, willing to uh, take uh, this architecture uh, approach and i'm happy to uh, help you uh, and connect with you with uh, your organization or uh, with your architecture team and uh, uh, help building or enhancing your architecture that you can use this as a way to move to the cloud as well as you can use this as a way to modernize your applications as well uh, so that's uh, all i have lined up and if there are any questions uh, i think you can take it that's that's fantastic, Asanka. So um, I presume that people have asked in the past, what are you smoking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you managed to get that out of the way early. I mean, it's really a creative, forward-thinking approach to thinking about architecture patterns. How's, what's the reception been like when you've talked about um, thinking about architecture in this sort of way? Uh, so I think uh, the the feedback is really good because this is a common problem most of the architects are uh, uh, facing as well as there are a lot of parallels to this concept like the hexagonal architecture and uh, I think uh, uh, LinkedIn is using something called domain oriented architecture all these concepts are similar and I think uh, this links with domain design, domain driven design as well. Uh, but we didn't have a proper way to architect it uh, because domain driven design is more bound with uh, object orientation. Uh, but this kind of creates more flexibility for us to uh, build real world applications as well as make it uh, future proof. And the beauty of this, you can even take a monolithic application and put it uh, uh, a, a gateway and make it a cell. Uh, so you can reuse the existing stuff and then build new stuff uh, so that alignment or the connectivity between the green field and brown field is there. So that's the beauty that I see uh, in this pattern. Right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I think there may be some challenges with my video. No, everything's fine. Look, Asanka, that was fantastic. Um, I'll invite you to leave the stage now, but thanks for sharing all of your contact details so people can 
um, connect with you afterwards. Uh, people have been asking in the chat area for yep. slide decks. So if you get a chance, could you put up um, uh, your, a link to your slides? Yeah, because it's, uh, yeah, um, there's a lot there. Uh, and we've got some questions. Uh, Div Divya Romani has asked one, If so if you could answer um, their questions in the stage chat as well, please. Yep, will do. Thank you. 